BCG acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. Uh, there's some more organised criminals that have a bit more nous about how they will tackle a farm and they'll go to power and they'll cut power. And that can disable the system if it's not planned correctly. It can cause the internet to go down, say for example, so there's no alerts coming through or it could stop a camera from working altogether. Hello and welcome back to Shared Ag Solutions by BCG. I'm Janine Batters and in this episode, sponsored by GE Silos, we're going to be speaking with Grant Sutton from Ag Cloud about farm security. Welcome, Grant. Thank you for having me, Janine. Super excited to have you here, Grant. So I thought for a start, we might just talk about, because this podcast is about new technology that on the horizon farm tech, that's what we're talking about. I thought for a start, it might be useful to talk about some of those new technologies, but for a start, can you just give us a little bit of a introduction to who you are and why you love farm security? I'm uh, the co-founder of AgCloud. We've been operating in this region and various other regions around the state for about six years. My background is in IT and security, but I've spent the last 20 years working in IT. So for a start, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about some of the new technologies in this farm security space? Yeah, so the main thing is the, the connectivity. Is, it's been a lot of changes in that field. The improvements with connectivity have come in, in obviously improving the obvious things like speed and location of where you can have the internet access. That's been a real game changer. We work with cameras, so the camera technology has also improved and changed as well, mostly with AI recognizing different things in the picture and being able to filter out the things you don't want to be alerted from. So could you give an example of that? So cameras have been notoriously annoying when it comes to alerting when you have something happen and getting alerts all the time has caused people to ignore the alerts that come through. Like in summer, you might have endless moths flying around the camera. So a lot of companies that manufacture cameras have heavily invested into filtering out that kind of thing through the use of AI. So they might be able to recognize that there's a vehicle going in a certain direction or a person walking through rather than just being a trigger of just a line being crossed. That sounds very smart. What other new technologies? So the camera quality has improved. The megapixels and the amount of zooming ability into the footage has improved so much that you can see a huge difference between cameras that are today's cameras and five years old that kind of thing. So they've become much more useful in that way. They improve their infrared. They improve, like I said, the AI stuff and the filtering of the alerts. And they integrate better with, with devices like mobile phones and, and that sort of thing as well. That is handy. And are they getting more reliable, Grant? Reliability is always a, an, an ongoing issue with, with any technology. So yeah, I would say they, they are more reliable. However, there is a lot of new cameras that are on the market, they don't necessarily have the lifespan on them as cameras that might be particularly designed for CCTV, Hick vision cameras, for example. What are Hick vision cameras, Grant? So they're, they're a, a brand or a company that have been manufacturing cameras for a very long time. And they're the cameras you probably see in Bunnings and McDonald's. And they're, they're the main brand of camera that we work with. Not that I'm trying to plug Hick vision or anything like that. But they're just a very reliable camera. So when you put the camera in, you know that it's going to last and it's going to last for a very long time. And in terms of, are they getting better in notifying you faster? Yeah, so there's lots of things that come into that. The quality of the internet connection is probably the most important part of that. And uh, yeah, notifying is, it's an expected thing now with surveillance. Like you want to be notified if, if you have a situation happening. There's no point having a camera that the notification doesn't work when you're expecting it to come through. You're spot on, aren't you? Because you can probably, you're saying that you want to get a camera that is meant for security because it's pretty important that it works when you need it to. And it's really important that you get the notifications when you need it to as well. Yeah, that's right. There's other things that go with cameras, like you've got lighting as well. The quality of the lighting is extremely important. You've got the notification aspect of it is something we focused a lot on. As our company has sort of grown, we've realized that that's the most critical part of it. You don't have to have every camera notifying you, but perhaps the critical cameras that have the entry points and that sort of thing. I can't help but think of the castle and it's like, where? Back there. <laughs> You've missed it. It's no good then, is it? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so taking a step back then, say I don't have any farm security. What do I do? Can you talk me through the, the first major steps where I should start? 
Yeah, so I'm dealing with this constantly, new customers that have nothing at all, or sometimes they have existing systems. But the main thing that I look at is what's the internet connectivity like on that property? It's crucial to have that at a certain quality. If you don't have that quality there or the internet's not performing, then the camera system will never work well. How do you get around that? Since Starlink's come out, that solves the problem incredibly well. So there's so many technologies of internet that are out there. You've got 4G, you've got fixed wireless, ADSL, which is pretty much finished with now. Or you've got SkyMaster Satellite from NBN. So the technologies are present in lots of farms, but since Starlink has come out, it has enabled the speed and the location of internet to be anywhere. So therefore it's changed the game a lot. And it's solving a lot of problems, isn't it? We were talking about this with Carmen Quaid and how it can solve so many authentication issues. And it's just going to make your farm business run better if you've got better internet is what I keep hearing. So you would say that's probably not a real problem then. It's just tick it off, get it. Yeah, Starlink is the best technology that there is. Then the, the, the next step is really to plan out the process of where the cameras go. So I'm always on Google Earth talking to the farmer, pinning out locations, looking at the direction and angle of the camera making sure there's line of sight back to a center point. That line of sight means that the radio bridge that you can have from point A to point B is clear. And that could be as close as 500 meters or as far as 15 kilometers. Are you talking about the signal between cameras? There's multiple components or pieces of infrastructure that make a camera work. So you've got got machinery sheds, workshops, fuel bowsers, chemical sheds. You've got spread out sites and even property to property you can't have the option of just plugging a camera into a recorder in that scenario so you have to plan out where is that radio bridge going to go to that point a to point b or multi-point one point c's five points and the radio bridge is for so you can store the footage no so the radio bridge is like a running a wire through the air and once you have that that virtual wire through the air then you effectively have a connection back to the recorder so the camera can feed its footage into the recorder through that radio link. Perfect. So they're really important. Absolutely. So that that's what sort of stumps a lot of people because the networking equipment that now is required to do these types of jobs is very IT based and it needs to be set up with monitoring so that if a certain site goes down, that site's gone down and why it's gone down. So do those cameras have that radio bridge included in them and you just know by getting someone in that sort of knows what they're doing they say well this camera and this camera can be this far apart and they need to have this amount of line of sight is that what you're saying yeah so on google earth you can tell the distances and the cameras that you purchase say from some of the retail outlets yeah they they may be wi-fi cameras they're called so they have the antennas attached to the camera that's never how we set up a system so okay so what's the difference i'm confused so that we start with a camera that's standalone. It's a camera specifically designed for a function of seeing a site in a fixed form or a PTZ pan tilt zoom, like it can move around. So you don't have anything other than the camera by itself. And then that camera gets cabled in to where a box is placed inside a shed on a wall near power. And then from that box, you also cable to a radio that bridges to, that's what the bridge is. It creates the bridge to that point where the gateway is or the internet is. It's, it's complex, but not really once you see how it's all planned out. So we've talked about connectivity, we've talked about the planning, and then having someone actually that knows what they're doing out on site, connecting up all those actual wires or yep. non-wires. And then what's next? Yeah, so the, the installing component where the cables are ran and all that is also crucial because I've seen a lot of existing jobs that have been done and it might be a self done job or it might be someone who's had a go we have certain rules about the installation of the cabling which has to be conduited and it has to go to a box and it has to be dust proof there's a lot of things you've got to get right on farms because you have rodents and you have cockatoos and you have there's any number of little creatures that want to come in and ruin what you've done so you've got to get that kind of right as well of course and obviously you guys would be super focused on that longevity because there'd be nothing worse than the farmer thinking that they've got a camera on that and then when they need it it's like oh it's been chewed through by a rat so i can see the importance of that how much power do they need and do you have any trouble with power and these radio waves the power is a big issue because it's quite often the target of the crook who'll come into the farm and look for power it depends on the crook because there's some that are just desperate they want to get there to get money for drugs or whatever 
getting in that quickly. But there's some more organized criminals that have a bit more nous about how they will tackle a farm and they'll go to power and they'll cut power. That disables the system or can disable the system if it's not planned correctly. It can cause the internet to go down, say, for example, so there's no alerts coming through, or it could stop a camera from working altogether. So we have to focus on where power is and how to protect the power, whether it's through a camera being able to see it or whether it's an alert that comes through when somebody's going to the power. And we also have solar as well. So we have systems that run, there's no option because there's no power at that shed. So therefore we have to make a solar system that works there. Wow, I didn't even think about that side of the power. I was thinking in terms of power surges and, and how they can affect the the transmission of internet. I can tell you that shearing sheds or places where there's an electric fence can have a big problem with the stability of the power in that bit of building. It might put a spike through and that can affect the equipment in there. So that is definitely a problem. You can get around that through yeah, solar power. battery power instead, which is isolated and separate from the main power. How much time do these cameras store? The cameras don't actually store footage themselves. They are recording a feed that goes back to a central point, to a recorder. So they can store footage in themselves if that's the way it's designed on an SD card, but they typically take the data back and it gets sent back through that wireless bridge back to the office of the house where the recorder is. But, you know, in terms of the power being a disruption to that particular camera at that particular site, or even the radio link at that particular site, all of that is possible. You can put a system in and you see it has problems later based off things you didn't consider before. But they're quite solvable, usually. That is good to know. So you record, it goes back to the farm office or wherever it's being stored. That's good. How much footage can be stored Yeah, so all of that is dependent on how the cameras are set up. The cameras could be recording on motion only. They could be recording full time. And the the recorder itself could have a certain capacity, certain amount of hard drives in it or sized hard drives that would cause the the length of recordings to to vary quite a bit. Okay, so it depends on the system. Yeah. So we've done the connectivity. You've told me where I'm going to put my cameras. But what sort of system am I going to get, Grant? What? How do I choose? What sort of systems are available and where do they have the best fit? You have the plan in place and, and that might include sensors as well, which I haven't really talked about here. But sensors are basically the standalone component of the project that, for example, we have a sensor that's buried in the track or a driveway. And when the sensor is triggered from some vehicle driving in or a gate opening over it, then the alert can come through to the phone. And we're working on this in the future, but the camera will actually turn and zoom to that point where that sensor is. So you have this sort of compounding thing going on where you've got multiple pieces of equipment working together to give you the best possible outcome of what you want, which is to see what that vehicle is and what it's doing. Sounds like that's the one I want, Grant. How much is that one? I always say to people, they say, how much is the system? And I I say, I'm really reluctant to say how much the system is because there is a lot of you know, decisions around how it is going to be given. Um, What's my ballpark though? I think our jobs are between five and 30,000. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gives me a good idea. Okay. So I want one of those. You'll put that in for me, will you? Absolutely. I don't do that myself. I do the survey and I, I talk to the farmer and plan out the job. You and do then, the digging? That's right. And then our installers will come and do it. <laughs> um, but look, there's something else that's come out and we've been heavily involved in this. It's the on-farm connectivity grant. And there's round two coming of that. So that's 15 million. The first round was great. We've been rolling that out and it's still finishing off some of those jobs. But the round two is coming and it's, you should look that up because it's really worthwhile. It's actually, the, the, the first round was 50, 50 dollar for dollar up to $60,000. So the farmer had to pay 30 if it was a $60,000 job. Not that many did that by the way, but that's, it's just a great opportunity. GE silos have been leading the way with their custom-built grain, pellet and fertiliser silos since 1978. Built using Australian-made steel and offering a large range of high-quality, standard and optional features, the team at GE silos can work with you to ensure you find the right silo to suit your needs. Contact GE silos today or visit gesilos.com.au for more information. GE silos the right storage solution. So I was talking to a farmer about that grant 
And he was a little bit unsure around what was expected of him or in terms of the data. And in, with that grant, do they collect your data? Not, not the camera data. No way. No. So There's what are they collecting? Nothing as far as data goes. There's no data that we would give over to the government. And I wouldn't want that anyway. Well, that is a really good thing Mm. because they were concerned that they didn't want to uptake it because of that reason. So I'm really glad that we've talked about that. Mm. So what other types of security systems? So what's a basic surveillance? There's different families of cameras and recorders that we offer as well. There's different amounts of cameras you can have in a recorder and there's different performances of recorders. So we go for what's called a high look recorder, which is more than adequate for most jobs. That's absolutely fine. But some really big farms might want the Hikvision recorder, which is a much bigger recorder. It's rack mountable and it's more designed around, say, if you had a budding store, for example, that would go into one of those types of stores. Having one of those recorders in your office might be a bit noisy. The fan isn't quite loud and they're just more durable in that way. They're more designed for that. But the high look is more designed to sit in your office and do the recording with a fairly low noise level and that kind of thing. That's the basic surveillance one. Yeah. yeah. So what about if I had a couple of bases on my farm? Would I have to use the HIC or could I still have the basic surveillance or do I have to have two? This is where we come into the trying to bridge the properties together with radio links. So we've scoped some out around here where the links are in excess of 20 kilometres. That means that the camera that's on the farm 20 kilometers away or the group of cameras are being fed through that radio link into the recorder that's that distance away. And therefore they have those multiple sites that are able to, you know, have all the cameras come to one location. And that's still the basic surveillance. Yeah, it still could be the basic surveillance. It's more about the quality of the radio link that has to be up to scratch. It's it's also about budget as well. The budget is very important. If, if it's at the higher end one, then they need to see the pros and cons of the more expensive one versus the less one. Sometimes it's just, it just isn't worth the extra money. And I mean, the, the more expensive one has better AI, better recognition of detection of objects or people or that sort of thing. And the lesser expensive one, it maybe just knows when a vehicle is going in a certain direction. So there's, there's a difference there, but that doesn't mean that everybody needs to go for the most expensive one. It's just based off what the name of the farm is. Yeah, that makes sense. So would you recommend that people start with the basic surveillance and then upgrade? Or are you talking more in terms of when you you know start somewhere and upgrade that you get more of the hick or more of... Yeah, so if you plan on doing more later on, I would start with what your expectations are in the, the, the final point. So you'd start with a better one, but maybe have less cameras or have cameras on the key points and then slowly work your way up into having more cameras. The cost of an installation isn't really the camera that's the most cost. It's the cabling and the radios. All that infrastructure together just adds up to be a significant cost. Changing a camera out that's got better 10 years later isn't going to be a huge cost. You know, it's it's like a camera is, say, $200, whereas the actual cabling and the, the radio and all the componentry is, exceeds that quite a bit. I'm glad that you cleared that up because that makes sense to me now. So are the multifunctional systems that I've been reading about, is that where you're talking about the underground sensor or are they something else? So what we like to do on farms is we like to make use of the cameras for more than just one purpose. So for example, they're called PTZs, which stands for pan, tilt, zoom. And what they do is they can rotate around and they can zoom up. To give you a scenario, for example, I had a lady who has cattle And she wants to be able to know when someone's coming down the driveway, which is a long driveway, maybe 500 meters long. And it's quite a distance away. It's probably about half a K away from where the camera is. So she wants to know when someone's entered. And then she wants to be able to look at her calving cows. And then also if there's a trigger from the entrance that she can jump on that camera, see who's coming in and then look at them and zoom up on them. And by the way, there's no internet there and there's no power. So what we did is she had a friend who lived about two Ks away who had Starlink on her house and we could see the house. And this doesn't work out all the time for everybody, but that's just how it did for her. So we've managed to get the Starlink from her house and bridged it to the camera station, which is a solar camera station. And then we have a base, it's called a LoRaWAN base that talks to the sensor that's buried in the very beginning of her driveway. So as someone comes to the driveway, She gets an alert on her phone and then she can jump on that camera, press a button and the camera will zoom to that point where the vehicle will be. And then she's alerted. She knows who's there. 
she can follow them around with her finger on the phone if she wants to. The The multifunction purpose of the camera is critical to what we're trying to achieve. We don't want to just, if you can use the camera for lots of functions, check the water, check the cattle, check the entrances, follow crooks around, whatever, then that's great. That's what we aim for. And farm safety too, that, that was a point you brought up earlier. I did a little bit of research before the podcast and I'm hearing a lot that farmers are hitting quite a few roadblocks when it comes to farm security and it just becomes... It's just too hard. So can you talk me through some of the those things, those common problems? Yeah, I mean, often you get a, a situation that's being done by the farmer and it's been done to a point where they're realizing that it's beyond their ability. It's like anything. I'm not a mechanic. I can't get into a car and I can't even change the oil. I'm sure if I learned that as a kid and grew up learning that, like my brother, I could do it, but I'm not really that interested. My interest has been in IT and this kind of stuff. Engage a professional if you want a serious system. If you just want a camera up on a hay shed because someone's flogging your hay, then yeah, go for a trail cam or, you know, I mean, I've heard stories of people being able to do that and they have caught people doing it. I remember there was a a theft event stealing hay all the time and they caught the guy through a trail cam. I talked to the farmer about it and he's like, it took us forever to finally catch him. He had to position that camera in the perfect position because he was coming back regularly to steal the hay. You don't always get that opportunity the way they keep coming back. Yeah, I just think you can get lucky sometimes and you can actually get a cheap system and get it to work for you. But yeah, other times not possible. What about support though? Because I feel like for so many of people living in rural areas, they get the system, they put the system in and then it breaks. And because they're not experts in it, it's very difficult. And then if you haven't got someone to ring, what is the support like? Yeah, so from our point of view, that's a hugely important component of what's needed with every job that's installed. You plan the monitoring. I have an alert coming to me of all the systems that have gone down or parts of the systems that might have gone down. And you can get this list and start looking into why. Quite often it's the same ones. You can see the the 4G might have gone down or that particular shed just keeps going down. So you can focus very specifically on the problems even before the customer is aware of it, like we can be aware of it. We can also put in place more advanced monitoring where the cameras are alerting us. We then contact the customer to say these cameras are gone down The reason for that is if the camera goes down and the farmer's not looking all the time at the cameras, then they don't know they've gone down. If something happens, then that's a huge problem. Yeah, because farmers are definitely not going to have time to be monitoring their cameras all the time. So can you fix a lot of problems from your office? We absolutely go out and fix things. Yep, we do. And we're in this, you know, we're in the Mallee and Wimmera a lot. We've got enough work going on here that we're just here almost all the time. We've got some presence here, but... A lot of the problems are solvable remotely. Like you can see that something has been unplugged. You can tell that there's been an interruption for some reason. So we can call the farmer and say, this looks like something's gone a bit weird here. It might be the, there was a windstorm and the radio's turned. So then we can say, can you just get back on the roof and turn that radio a little bit? And then it's all back again. Or say, for example, our shearers have come in and they've sheared and they switched off the power because they plugged in their charger or something or they plugged in their radio and we can sort of immediately get that alert to see that switched off. So the monitoring side of it is actually really critical. Do you find that happens a lot, particularly with do they get hit by hail? How durable are they to weather? The Hick Vision and High Look cameras are fantastic. Like they're very robust and very strong. And like I said, the cabling we do is very good as well. The main problems to us seem to be internet related, like the internet drops out Okay, so if I wanted to get, this might put you under pressure, but if I said, sign me up, Grant, want one, what's the turnaround time? We're looking at four to six weeks turnaround. Okay, so you would have seen a lot of farms, you've been around a lot of farms and you've got that farm security hat on. Are there some things that you think our listeners could do or some top tips that perhaps don't relate to farm cameras, but you think do these things and you're going to be going a long way towards better farm security. There's a few key things like having a good tidy farm and good signage, good gates. That's really important. And that seems to be a consistent thing going on. And I suppose this is a bit off topic, but the theft that occurs on farms, which is typically fuel, vehicles, tools, chemical, all of that's significant when it happens and it 
but I've also seen another type of crime, which is a little bit less on the topic that I'm talking about here, which is cybercrime. And again, it seems strange that I'm ju- jumping into this, but because of my IT background, that has had a significant um, presence in in people when I talk to them, the scams or the hacking or, or whatever that's occurring. We get to see a bit of that. We get to see their you know, we see their email address, we see how well protected their, their, the state of affairs is in that regard as well. And because we're trying to prevent theft, I ask them some of those questions too. It's a really good point because it's you could lose just as much money, if not more, from cybercrime. You've been so generous with your time and I really appreciate it. And it's been really interesting. Just in general, in life, what is the best advice that you've been given? I think persistence, the sticking to something and getting better at it and just continuously growing in what you do. That's a great attitude. What are the main things that farm you see farmers focusing their cameras on? I always say a camera on fuel is essential. You have to have that on there because it's such easy pickings. And would you also say workshops, like farm machinery sheds? Oh, yeah. There's the key things. There's fuel, you know, there's the workshops, there's chemical, the entry points. What's the main point where they're going to come in at? You've got to angle the camera right. You want to make sure the camera is in the most optimal place so that it can see the vehicle and see the number plate if that's possible. Does that mean that you have to have a light at your entry or can the camera see that? Our sensor tags that are buried in the ground, when they are activated, they can activate power. So we can actually have that trigger lights and that lighting is always fantastic to have. It's not only a deterrent to coming in and going further see the way i see it when a crook comes in if they think someone's there the risk is higher because from my understanding and i've been told this by police the situation changes from a burglary to an aggravated burglary so if someone's there when they rob the place it's an aggravated burglary therefore there is a higher charge for that they'll be more likely to avoid that and therefore that's a deterrent so they would just go to the next farm, unfortunately. That's what they do. They're not going to stop what they're doing. They're going to go somewhere else. Yeah, that is a really good point. I was thinking it would just be nice for when my visitors came that they would drive through and be like, oh, lights, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be good when you're you know, bringing in the gear from sowing or harvest. So you're bringing the header or, and you've been working all through the night and they want to see the yard. So the sensor can actually trigger the lights to come on and they can, yeah, they're suddenly there. They can see everything. If you love the podcast and would like to show your support, please rate us five stars wherever you listen to your podcasts and share it with your friends. BCG's main field day in 2024 is on the 11th of September. The event offers growers and advisors the latest in local agronomic research, including disease management, new varieties, new herbicide technology, nutrition and farming systems. Entry is free for BCG members. To become a member or for more information, visit bcg.org.au or call 03 5492 2787.